Okay. Wrong business. Hello, this is Dr. George Rogu from RBK Pediatrics. Tonight, I have a special guest. My student, Dr. Chan from NICOM, third year medical student, has been rotating with me for a month, learning as much as we can about general pediatrics and COVID-19. So we decided to make this little presentation about the COVID-19 vaccine, share some of our experience and an overall quick academic presentation about this topic. So Dr. Chan, if you'd like to take this over. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ogu. So my name is Yuning again, and we are gonna be talking about COVID-19 vaccines. Before we begin, I would just like to briefly talk about how do vaccines work in general. So the first time a person is infected with a virus that causes COVID-19, it can take several days, up to weeks, for the body to make um, uh, sufficient immune cells to fight off the infection. And during this period, we get symptoms, the very uncomfortable symptoms of fever, headache, chills, and um, you know, muscle pains. Through this way, after the infection has been fought off by our immune system, we are left with T cells and B cells that make antibodies. Those are the ones that will um, be part of the immune response that fight off any future infection by the same virus again. So how do vaccines work in general is that we can skip this process of getting sick, but give our body the equipment that it needs to fight off the infection once we're exposed to the COVID-19 virus. So currently there are three types of COVID vaccines in development. The first one is called protein subunit vaccines. It contains a harmless protein from the coronavirus. It's called a spike protein. And the spike protein is unique to the virus. As you can see in this picture, this red little um, protein on the surface of the virus is what is contained in the vaccine. And this harmless protein will produce immune response that our body will then use as trigger to mount um, an attack on the virus itself. The second type of vaccine is a vector vaccine, which contains a weakened version of a live virus. That is a different virus than the coronavirus, but has the genetic material of the coronavirus. And the third type of vaccines is the mRNA vaccines, which also contains genetic material of the coronavirus. What happens is both of these vaccines will give our cells instructions to make the spike protein. And once our bodies produce the spike proteins and the T cells and the B cells, which are our immune cells, recognize that the foreign spike proteins, which should not be there, is in our system, they will mount a response against these specific spike protein against coronavirus so that in the future if we are ever infected with the actual virus itself we have already have cells that knows how to make the antibodies to fight it off so here is an illustration of how the rna vaccine works scientists will take part of the coronavirus genetic material and add it to the vaccine and the vaccine is, is injected into a person's body and once it enters the cell, it will give you give the cells instructions on how to make the spike protein unique to the coronavirus. And this picture here, you can see the spike protein on the surface of the virus, but it doesn't give you the virus itself. So the body's immune system sees that there is a spike protein in our system, and they will react to it and activate T cells and B cells to destroy them with the, uh, the spike protein. And later on, we are left with um, antibodies against this spike protein, which is from the coronavirus. So if we're exposed to the vi uh, virus again, we can have sufficient antibodies around to fight off the virus. So the mRNA vaccines are a new technology, but they are not unknown. Scientists have been studying this for decades, and currently there are two vaccines that are authorized and recommended to prevent COVID-19 disease. The first one is by Pfizer, and the second one is by Moderna. So it's important to note that even though these two vaccines are approved by FDA with the emergency use authorization, these vaccines are held to the same rigorous safety and effectiveness standards as all the other types of vaccines that we routinely give out to children and to people, such as the flu vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccines. 
So just to give some summary of comparing the COVID vaccines by the two companies, they're both mRNA vaccines. To be eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccines, you need to be at least 16 years old. For a Moderna vaccine, you need to be at least 18 years old. Both of them are a two-dose series. For Pfizer, they have to be uh, three weeks apart from each other. And for Moderna, you have to wait at least four weeks before getting the second dose. And based on the clinical trials they've conducted, the Pfizer biotech is vaccine is about 95% effective, and Moderna is about 94.1% effective at preventing lab-confirmed COVID-19 disease in people who have received the two doses of the vaccines and who had no evidence of previously being infected. So that's very actually very high high percentage of prevention. Um, so both companies have conducted one large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase two and phase three clinical trials on their vaccines. For the Pfizer group, they enlisted more than 43,000 participants. The median age is about 52 years. And for Moderna, they enlisted about 30,000 participants, with also 52 years being the median age. And the race and ethnic breakdown of the participants for both groups for um, the white, popu white, pop white, white population, um, they're about 80 to 70, 79 to 81%. And Hispanic and Latino group is about 20 to 26%. The African American group is 98 to 9.7%. And the Asian group is 4.4 to 47%. And all other races and ethnicities are less than 3% from the participants. And about 50 to 52 percent of the participants were male, 49 and 57 percent of the participants were female. And it's interesting to note that uh, people older than 65 years old are also included in the vaccine trials. Up to 21 percent was in the uh, Pfizer group and up to 25 percent was included in the Moderna group. And now I'm going to talk about the GREAT assessment. The GREAT assessment is a tool developed by the advisory committee for immunization practices. And this is a tool that the FDA and CDC use to make recommendations about vaccinations using evidence-based um, data. So for the prevention of symptomatic COVID disease, both vaccines are rated as high certainty, which means that they are pretty effective at preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease. And for the prevention of COVID-19 associated hospitalization, Pfizer group is rated for low certainty and Moderna is rated at moderate certainty. But it's important to note that if um, they're effective as preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease, it is also suggested that uh, COVID-19 associated hospitalization is also therefore successfully prevented. And as for prevention of asymptomatic COVID infection and all-cause death, they're both rated very low certainty. So there's not enough evidence to suggest that the vaccines can effectively prevent asymptomatic COVID infection. And reactogenicity, which are mild to moderate symptoms after you receive the vaccination, they're both high certainty for both Pfizer and Moderna. As for serious adverse events, both are rated for uh, moderate certainty. So what are some COVID-19 vaccine reactions? The reactogenicity symptoms are defined as any local site, uh, local injection site reactions or systemic reactions that occur within the seven days after you get the vaccine. And they were reported pretty frequently, but mostly mild to moderate. So local reactions you can get after getting the vaccine include some pain, you can get some swelling on the shoulder, you can get some redness and warmth at the injection site and axillary lymph node. Um, as for systemic adverse symptoms, the most common ones reported were fatigue, fever, muscle pain, and um, headache. So they both, Pfizer and Moderna group reported onset of the systemic adverse symptoms were about one to two days within vaccination. And then for Pfizer group, they were they result within one day and for Moderna, they result within two to three days. And it's interesting to note that much more, more it was more common for the systemic adverse reactions to occur after getting the second dose. And they were more severe in a younger age group 
which are less than 55 years old for Pfizer and less than 65 years old for Moderna. The studies also stated that anaphylaxis following vaccination was not observed in the clinical trials for both Pfizer and Moderna, but outside of the clinical trials, they have been reported, but these are very, very few cases compared to the general population who received the vaccine so far. So any contraindications to the COVID vaccines include any persons with a history of immediate allergic reaction of any severity, so if you have ever had an, if you ever develop anaphylaxis after getting the first dose of the mRNA COVID vaccine or any of its component, including polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, you may develop immediate allergic reaction. You should not get the second dose of COVID vaccine. And the immediate allergic reaction usually occurs within four hours following vaccination, could include any hypersensitivity related signs, any hives that you break out, any swelling on your face, closing up of your throat, difficulty breathing, wheezing, stridor, um, anaphylaxis, such as a screen, skin rash, you can have some nausea and vomiting, lightheadedness, and you can develop, develop low blood pressure, weak and rapid pulse. So these are all signs that you should not get the COVID vaccines. So other than these, there's also a couple more points to talk about when you are discussing whether or not you should get the mRNA vaccines. So CDC made recommendations that if you are sure, if you have a known COVID-19 exposure, that is you're exposed to somebody who is positive for COVID, you should wait until your quarantine period has ended to receive your vaccine. And this is to, for two reasons. Number one, it, it's not, um, the immune system will take time to develop antibodies after you completed the two dose series. So you will likely get the infection before you fully develop the immunity against COVID. But also this is not to expose the healthcare personnel for COVID. So this is to also protect the people who are administering your vaccine. And the COVID vaccine is not for outbreak management or post-exposure prophylaxis for the same exact reason. And for anybody who, is, who belongs to the following group, there's just not enough data available yet regarding the safety and effectiveness for um, regarding the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. So if you are an immunocompromised individual, if you are on immunosuppressant drugs, if you have any autoimmune conditions, any history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, Bell's palsy, or if you're pregnant, you have to be aware, um, be aware that um, the studies have now not yet shown that these are gonna be as safe and as effective as someone who doesn't have those conditions. So you may get the vaccine, but there's, not, there's no evidence to guarantee that it will be the same. So you have to discuss with your physician and evaluate the risk and benefits for getting the vaccines. So because of the reactions that people can get after getting vaccinated, the CDC recommends an observation period for um, after vaccination for anybody who's getting the vaccine. If you have a history of immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a vaccine or any injectable therapy, or if you or end, if you have history of anaphylaxis for any reason, you should be observed for at least 30 minutes. Any other person should be at least, at least waiting um, 15 minutes before you leave after getting the vaccination. So lastly, I would like to share with Dr. Rogu about our experience, the experience getting the Moderna COVID vaccine. Um, so we had an appointment with um, the North got it last Friday and um, the average wait time was about one hour and they were very good about controlling the number of people who enter the building with signs on the floor to indicate to make sure that people are standing within like you know standing six feet apart and we were directed to nursing stations where they had set up several of them divided by the curtains and the nurse will administer the vaccines to us and as well as give us a card that proved that we received the vaccine. And then afterwards, we were directed to a seating area that is also arranged six feet apart from everybody else with an EMT on site to ensure that in case if you develop any symptoms, you are sent to the hospital immediately. And then after you wait your 15 minutes, you are sent out. 
And um, the, the same day I got the vaccine, I didn't develop any other symptoms other than having some soreness on, the, on my shoulder where I got the vaccine. And that lasted only for about a day. How about you, well, Dr. Obu? Well, thank you, Dr. Chen, for um, this wonderful presentation. It was very enlightening. <clears throat> I'm sure our patients are going to um, learn a lot about the vaccine. My personal experience with the vaccine was you know, we waited, we got the vaccine, I went home, everything was fine. I did have a little bit of tiredness, but it was 11 o'clock or midnight. I just felt a little bit of, uh, maybe a little fatigue for a couple of hours, and then it went away. I went to work the very next day, the second day after that, the third day after that, like nothing happened. Um, so I'm very happy that we got the vaccine. I can say that most of our staff at RBK Pediatrics have already um, received their vaccine. Um, and like I told you before, our office is enrolled and approved to administer the vaccine. And I just got news um, that we are able to order the vaccine and we should be uh, uh, having it in our office um, probably in an immediate future. The hope is once they, um, lower the eligibility requirements, we will be able to give it to the parents of our patients, hopefully. Um, so stay tuned for what RBK Pediatrics will be doing. What will happen with the children, the younger children, I predict that the vaccines will be given to them, but much, much later in time. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And I wish, you, I wish you a lot of luck in the medical school. Thank you. Okay.